You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's Acts 1.8. Peter and John have that power and are boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ to all of the people who are gathered at the temple that day. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit to speak the word boldly. Peter is proclaiming the resurrected Christ. If you remember from last week's scripture, Peter and John had just healed a beggar, a crippled beggar. These two were filled with power, and you see, they they weren't afraid to use it. They were bold in the Spirit. Psalm 68, 34 says this, Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. You are awesome, O God, in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Praise be to God indeed. You see, power is an amazing thing. Everyone seems to want it. But for most people, it's not the power of the Holy Spirit they want. It's the power of wealth or the power of control, the power of authority, or maybe all three or even more. Webster's New World Dictionary describes power as a person or thing having great influence and force or authority. It also goes on to say that power denotes the inherent ability or the admitted right to rule, govern, or determine. That's what today's scripture is all about. Power and control. Who is now the authority in Jerusalem? And who has that power and control? Who or what is being challenged and by whom? In Jerusalem at this time, there is a group of Jews called the Sadducees who are the dominant power in the temple to rule over the Jewish people. Their power and control is now being challenged and the status quo is being threatened. Imagine that. The apostles are preaching another authority. They're also preaching resurrection. The Sadducees are completely opposed to this. A power struggle is about to ensue, and the common people are ready to believe the apostles and to believe in the healing. In fact, they are rejoicing that this 40-year-old man man has been healed. However, the Sadducees are worried that their power base is about to erode. The power of the name would once again be used. Jesus and the Holy Spirit would be in control and the disciples would be protected. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we give you thanks for these writings of Luke that tell us about the early church, the struggles that they had, about Peter and John, and about the power and control in the Roman Empire at that time. And so, Lord God, now I ask that you take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, so that they become your words, both for our hearing and for our doing. In your Son's name, amen. By the 1740s, Charles Wesley... That's the brother of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. Charles Wesley was regularly preaching to thousands in the open air, but you see, opposition was developing. He first encountered physical danger when a doctor in Wales, angry over Charles' sermon, stormed up to him and demanded an apology for having been called a Pharisee. Charles, who wasn't known for his tact, replied, I still insist you are a Pharisee. My commission is to show you your sins, and I shall make no apology for so doing. You are a damn sinner. You have to admit, the Wesleys were bold. Well, the doctor struck Charles with his cane, causing a disturbance involving several men and women. Here's the entry in Charles's diary from July 22, 1743. I had just named my text at St. Ives when an army of rebels broke in upon us. They began in a most outrageous manner, threatening to murder the people if they did not go out that moment. They broke the sconces, dashed the windows in pieces, tore away the shutters, and all but the stone walls. 
I stood silently looking on, but mine eyes were unto the Lord. They swore bitterly I should not preach there again, which I disapproved by immediately telling them that Jesus Christ died for all. Several times they lifted up their hands and clubs to strike me, but a stronger arm restrained them. They beat and dragged the women about, particularly one of great age, and trampled on them without mercy. The longer they stayed and the more they raged, the more power I found from above. It was during these days of danger that Charles wrote his triumphant hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King. That third verse we sang earlier this morning. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Now remember, Charles and John Wesley went about England proclaiming the gospel amidst strong resistance from church authorities and other influential people. But they slowly won over the common people. They started a great awakening in England, a revival of religion. Interestingly, this entry appeared in Charles' journal a few years later. Sunday, July 13, 1746. At St. Ives, no one offered to make the least disturbance. Indeed, the whole place is outwardly changed in this respect. I walk the streets with astonishment, scarce believing it's St. Ives. It is the same throughout all the country. All opposition falls before us. In this story, Charles had the power of the Holy Spirit. He was proclaiming the gospel boldly without concern for what might happen. He seemed to know that God would protect him. However, what he preached caused a great disturbance among the people to whom he was preaching. You see, this often happens. When people are convicted of their sins and their wrongdoing, their first reaction is to get angry and then to rebel. The good news can be very threatening to them. It is simply Jesus Christ coming against those powers of darkness. Well, this is what was happening to Peter and John in our scripture story today. As our story opens, the priests, which are sometimes called scribes, and then the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, our scripture says, were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seize Peter and John. They put him into jail till the next day. Remember, John and Peter had come to the temple that afternoon for prayers, and all of this then happened afterwards. The Sadducees kept them until the next day because it was already getting towards evening, and nothing would be done after sunset. Now, you have to understand this group called the Sadducees to understand why they are so upset. You see, the Sadducees were a political religious sect who had come into existence around 142 B.C. They opposed the Pharisees. They rejected the traditional interpretations of the law accepted by the Pharisees, and they accepted the written law strictly. The Sadducees denied that the soul is immortal. They denied the resurrection of the dead. They denied that there were rewards and punishments after death. They denied the existence of angels and other demonic spirits. The Sadducees were wealthy landowners who wished to preserve what they owned, and they wanted no problem with Rome. The temple was under their power and control. They benefited greatly from the riches that were brought to the temple by the worshipers. You may remember the money changers in the temple and the selling of certain animals for sacrifices. You see, all of that money went into their coffers. This is what Jesus rebelled against when he cleared the temple. The Sadducees were hated by the common people. They were considered to be traitors because they worked so closely with the Romans. The Sadducees disappeared after the fall of the temple in 70 A.D. by the Romans. You see, they no longer had anything to support their work or their political dealings with Rome. Well, the next day, Peter and John are brought from jail into the presence of the Sanhedrin, that ruling Jewish, Jewish body in Jerusalem. 
The scripture tells us that Annas was there along with Caiaphas, the current high priest, and the son-in-law of Annas. John, that is mentioned, was thought to be one of the sons of Annas and later became a high priest after Caiaphas. And then there was Alexander, another member of the family. You see, the Sadducees had the power. They begin to question Peter and John. Now, now listen to what they ask in verse 7. By what power or name did you do this? Who gave you permission to heal that lame and crippled beggar? In other words, they were saying, we are the power and authority here. It's not for you to do that or for you to preach the resurrected Christ. You are not operating under our rules or with our permission. How dare you take this authority upon yourselves? The Sadducees want control, and they feel their authority is being challenged. And so with that question to Peter, the Sadducees open the door for Peter to witness in a spectacular way. Follow along in your Bibles as we continue with verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified but God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. What a testimony. Now you have to understand that every time Peter uses the word name, it's really a substitute for the word Yahweh or God. They will not pronounce God's name because it's too holy. Peter is saying that his power is coming from none other than God himself. Imagine the astonishment of the Sanhedrin. They considered themselves God's authority. After all, it was only the high priest who could enter the Holy of Holies once a year and beg for forgiveness and salvation for the Jewish people. Here are Peter and John telling the Sanhedrin and the crowd of people listening that salvation is found in no one else or by no other name than Jesus Christ. They are preaching under God's power, and they are preaching by Jesus' authority. So what's the Sanhedrin to do? <laughs> How could they publicly deny what had taken place when that lame man is standing right there before them? They could see that all the people were praising God for the miracle that had taken place, something that they themselves could not do. The Sadducees lacked the power of the name. If you read on in the passage, notice what the Sanhedrin finally decides to tell Peter and John. Verse 18. Then they, the Sanhedrin, called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John reply, it is better for us to speak to the people obeying what God wants us to preach or is it better to obey you? We have been with God's Son, Jesus Christ. And we are only speaking the truth about what we have seen and what we have heard. The Sanhedrin can only threaten them, but they cannot punish the disciples in the presence of a praising crowd and still expect to keep their control over the Jewish people. They would look like fools. They would look like fools to deny the name of God. You see, the Sadducees' base of power and control had been threatened by none other than God himself through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Sadducees did not have on the throne of their hearts God. They were on the throne of their hearts. They were only worried about their current power and, and their own wealth and their worldly possessions. They did not rule with God's kingdom in mind, but, but with their earthly kingdom and their comfort as their primary reasons. The Sadducees wanted peace with Rome and preservation of their opulent lifestyle, no matter what the cost to the relationship with God, and, and especially with God's relationship with the Jewish people. And so my question to you today is this. Who sits on the throne of your heart? Who sits on the throne of your heart? 
Many people want to serve God, but only as advisors. They cannot make themselves subservient to his will. They cannot see themselves as servants of a king who died to ultimately save them. Remember, God doesn't grade on a curve. He grades on the cross. Where do you place the cross in your life? Who is the power and authority in your life? Who are you going to serve? When you are in charge of the throne of your heart, you can be led by things of the flesh, by untruth, by the things of the world. You will process the world according to your wants and desires, but this heart will eventually crack and Satan will make his way into it because you have made Jesus Christ subservient to you. You do not have the faith and boldness in Christ and a relationship with God to stand up to these things. On the other hand, if you put Jesus on the throne of your heart, then where are you? You are subservient to the cross, to Jesus. And when Jesus is in charge of your heart, you'll be led by the things of truth and grace. You will have a relationship with God and therefore will not be led astray. You will process the things of the world through the truths of his word. You will be subservient to the cross and the teachings of Jesus. You will love God and you will love your neighbor. You will have a boldness of faith because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So, who is in power and control of your life? You have to decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the worldly things? Will your wants and desires be in control of your life? If so, the scripture guarantees they will lead you to ultimate downfall into an eternal separation from God. It's commonly called going to hell. This is just what happened to the Sadducees after the destruction of the temple. Read your Bibles. They're never heard from again. You have to decide who you're going to serve. If you serve the things of the kingdom with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in control of your life, then the scriptures guarantee that you will be crowned with glory and you will be eternally in the presence of God. It's commonly called going to heaven. This is just what happened to Peter and John. And guess what? We're still telling their stories today. God, in his perfect wisdom, has given us the freedom to choose who we will serve. He has given us the freedom to choose who will be the power and control in our lives. This is an awesome responsibility. It is a choice that will be with us for an eternity. I don't know about you, but I choose to serve God and to place Jesus Christ on the throne of my heart and to have him be the power and control over my life. Lord God, we give you thanks for the boldness of Charles and John Wesley. We give you the thanks for the boldness of, John, of Peter and John. Lord, help us to have that boldness. Help us to clear out all that garbage in our hearts and make room for the Holy Spirit to come in. Let it take control of us. Let us be servants to the cross. Let us be servants to Jesus. And make us bold to tell this gospel message to others. In Jesus' name, amen.